Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Thank you very much all for showing up at what's a pretty awkward time. It's very early in the morning in uh, Tokyo, and it's dinner time here in the United in New, in New York. Anyway, the United States. Um, we've got a huge audience. It's about 400 people who have registered, which is a testament to either David Barron's uh, status as a rock star or mine, and I'm guessing it's probably David. Uh, so I, me, I am Alicia Ogawa. I run the project on Japanese corporate governance and stewardship at Columbia Business School. Uh, the project aim is not to focus on Japan specifically, which is a very narrow topic, but it's a rather a comparative project uh, comparing the United States, Europe, UK, and Japan, because my view is on the shareholder versus the stakeholder continuum. Uh, US is at one extreme and Japan's on the other extreme, but we're now in the middle of very powerful forces which are pushing both of them closer towards the middle. And uh, it's my hope that we all have a lot to learn from each other in terms of best practices of each region. So that's the point of the project. Uh, I wanna take a second to explain that when I was a young undergraduate student, uh, I was a student of Professor Hugh Patrick, who is dialed in, by the way, and I was one of the first administrators, administrative assistants hired at the new research center, the Center on Japanese Economy and Business, which Professor Patrick uh, founded 34 years ago. Uh, the center has developed into the leading source of research and study on Japanese economics, politics, and business in the United States, and we enjoy the support of so many top level Japanese companies who have become not just financial supporters, but friends who share information, experiences, and uh, viewpoints with us. So it's a special honor for me uh, to be leading this project. Um, many of you will uh, be well aware of this. I just want to set the stage in 30 seconds. The Abe reforms of 2014 and 15 set new guidelines for Japanese companies in terms of their accountability to shareholders. And it also set new standards and responsibilities for shareholders who are expected to engage with in dialogue with corporate executives and continuously evaluate them and give them feedback. Um, this was a difficult transition. It continues to be a difficult transition from what was formerly a very closed system, which is populated by lifetime employees answerable only to each other. It's now giving way to a more open system, which needs to embrace outsiders on the board of directors, and it needs to embrace more open dialogue with shareholders and especially foreign shareholders who make up something like 70% of um, turnover on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. This change hasn't been easy and progress has been uneven to be polite about it. Foreigners were in, at first really enthusiastic um, participants in the first wave of Abenomics. They came into the Japanese equity market and bought very aggressively. Um, but that trend has pretty much reversed and I think we're now pretty much back to where we started before all these corporate governance reforms and Abe's third arrow was launched. So this is a subject I hope that David will speak to. David um, is a fellow grad student of mine uh, and he's been in the thick of things during this period of change. He is the co-founder of Symphony Financial, um, which is a hugely successful fund. Uh, I think it's almost 30 years ago, David will, will correct me, that the fund was established. But David, being in the thick of this tumultuous period, uh, has a lot to say about the changes in the Japanese equity and about the changes that refuse to happen. So we're really fortunate to have him with us. Uh, let me take 60 seconds to go over some housekeeping. Uh, I think we have a number of people from uh, the fourth estate, the reporters on the call. And uh, David has asked me to say that to the press, his remarks are quite off the record. So uh, please respect that. Uh, David is not in a position to discuss any of his portfolio companies, obviously. And uh, I intend to lead off with 30 minutes or so of questions to David and then open it up to questions from all of you. Um, there's a good chance because I'm very talkative as, of days, as David is, there's a good chance that we may not be able to answer all the questions. And I'm very cognizant that there are Columbia students uh, on this call who may or may not be specialists in Japanese corporate governance. And I would like to invite them and anybody else whose question we don't get to, to email me with follow-up. I would be delighted to do that. 
So without further ado, uh, can I get David up on the screen? David Rockstar Baron up on the screen, there he is. Let me kick off. Um, I thought given our personal history, we both started working in Japan about the same time. We were both students at the same time. Uh, I wanted to reflect back for a minute. Um, the, for me, the big changes in Japan really started in 1986, which was the first year that the TSE opened up membership for foreign firms. And you know, there are a lot of foreigners who came to work in the industry. And uh, security analysis and security trading was kind of a new thing in Japan back then. Um, so I wanted to ask you, um, what made, in your view, what created this first wave of foreigners into the Japanese equity market? Where did they focus their attention? How did the infrastructure, the research, the trading, the investment banks affect what they were doing? And do you think that the, how did you evaluate this first wave? Hmm. Uh, well, well, thank you for inviting me, uh, Alicia, CJ. Thank you, Professor Patrick. I know you're, you're in there somewhere. <laughs> and uh, you know, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you. So I appreciate everything you've taught me. And, I think Dean Lewis is on the call as well, and I have sure. to thank you very much, Robin, uh, for uh, you know our relationship over these thirty years or so. Uh, so when Alicia asked me to come and support the school, uh, you know I would bend over backwards. Um, you know your your first question, you know, going back to you know when when we both started. Uh, you know, when I came to Japan for work, you know, I came to Japan originally in, in 1981. Yes. But when I came for work, you know, in, in 87, uh, you know, I was futures and options, you know, trading, execution. Uh, you know, as you say, you know, foreigners were interested in the Japanese market, but at the same time, Japanese were allocating more and more into derivatives into the United States as Ministry of Finance allowed them to trade. Um, you know, S and P five hundreds and um, and bond and and, uh, and uh, euro yen futures. <clears throat> so I was actually in the crossroads between the two, and you know what was striking to me at the time was how inefficient and I don't like to use the word unsophisticated, but maybe unaware of some of the strategies that could be deployed into markets uh, elsewhere in the world were not being deployed in Japan. So Japanese allocators and you know, whether you want to, I mean, I was at Lehman at the time, so Nippon Life, you know, obviously a big um, shareholder in Lehman. The, the things that they were doing were um, you know, pretty parochial yeah. based upon, you know, you know, <laughs> um, compared to what we were doing. Uh, so I think foreigners became first, you know, enticed by the Japanese equity market um, you know, through the, the, let's call them inefficiencies and the scale of what you could deploy. You couldn't, you couldn't put a billion dollars to work in the Chinese equity market at the time. You know, you could get a billion dollars to work in Nikkei futures. Right. And then at cash and, and whatnot through that. So, you know, I think that's what really started, um, you know, the focus. Look, look you know, Euro European investors, um, I think, were much more sophisticated yes. uh, at, at, at corporate analysis of yes. Japanese companies, you know, back in the 80s and 90s than, than uh, you know, my, my fellow countrymen in America. Uh, everybody that I knew was looking at it as, a, as an arbitrage. Yeah, you know, can or, I... Or trading options or, you know, whatnot. Um, so... You know, I, I think that's evolved, and, and I, I do take notice of your, your comment that, you know, foreigners are 70% of turnover. It's like, mm, well, foreign computers are. <laughs> Just most of the activity that you're seeing, most of the activity on the exchange, which is a big problem, you know, is high-frequency trading. Yes. Um, and, and, and that is very different from, from before. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I, I, this was sort of a leading question because I think this issue about what attracts foreigners to the Japanese market and um, are, they, uh, are they building their positions on false assumptions or, 
or on real ex expectations is a, is a key question. So when I first started working in the Japanese equity market, I was working for a British firm, and I found that our American clients were very much spreadsheet driven. It's like my model. I'm going to plug it in and my model spits out the answer, which particularly in those days, you know, the Japanese market did not obey those rules. And I found that the European investors, to your comment about being more sophisticated, they were more willing to play with the qualitative aspects to try to understand the context a little bit more. But, uh, you know, again, I want to keep coming back to like, these. Now that we have different waves of, of, of foreigners, activists, engagements, passive funds, you know, I think it's, I think it's worth asking this question about where is yeah. the connect where is the disconnect so uh let me follow on by asking about what was in your mind when you set up symphony what was your goal what opportunity were you chasing why is it um and, and again why is it that you were so unusual why in the 70s every you know, you'd work at lehman or goldman or morgan stanley for two years and then you'd set up your own hedge fund or your own distressed fund your own macro fund, whatever. We never saw that wave in Japan until very, 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 very recently. So please tell me about what was the time when you set up Symphony. Okay, well, let me, let me unpack that a little bit because there are sort of two, there are two questions in there. Um, I, I think the reason you didn't see uh, a, a great many uh, independent uh, hedge funds, you know, two guys in a Bloomberg being set up in Japan was most of the people who were qualified to do that, qualified in terms of capabilities, didn't have capital. Mm. You know, everybody would start with, you know, some of their own money <clears throat> and, and, and get to work. And very difficult to do that in Japan. Right. Uh, granted, there were some people who did it, you know, in the U.S., focused on Japan. But I think at the time, certainly, um, you know, Shibata-san and I were, very much pioneers in willing to you know, step out on our own. Um, but, you know, when we, when we did that, and, you know, this goes back, you know, we, Shibata and I started working together really in 90, 97, 98, set up the, the actual company in 2000 and the fund in 2003. Wow, that's a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we did have a very different view, and, and that's probably what, helped us, you know, through all these years, and, and it stands today, that, you know, the, the Japanese equity market is unique in that it offers a, you know, an opportunity to capitalize on, on an inefficiency that's endemic to the system. It's not, well, you know, this price is wrong. Or that, you know, if, a, if something stays at, you know, one times every duh for two decades, that's the price. It's not wrong. Right. And, you know, as you go back to talking about, you know, European models uh, versus American models, I mean, oh, no, it's, it's a value trap. It's never, no, it's not a value trap. That, that's the price. What you're missing is something to change market perception of that price. That's exactly. So, you know, and we've, we've talked about this for years. It's like, you know, my biggest problem when I, when I engage with, um, Let's say more more aggressive uh, you know, investors in this market say, "Oh, this is at the wrong price." And I'm like, "Well, is management doesn't trade stock, so it's not really their job to change the price. It's their job to change market perception of what the price should be, you know, or as quote unquote activists have now, um, you know, taken taken the mantle and said, "Well, you should sell off this asset or that." And management's like, "Well." I don't know. I've been running this business for 20 years and having that asset has been a pretty good thing for us. The fact that it has, has come to you know, dominate some of our, our balance sheet or income statement, isn't that a good thing? Why would I sell it? So, you know, when I, when I think about, you know, things like Sony, I mean, you know, Dan's gone from, I hope Dan's not on the phone, um, uh, you know, sell off the, the, uh, the entertainment business, no sell off the, the TV business, no sell off this. It's like, you know, my, my friends who are at Sony are like, what is it today? So, yeah. you, you know, you, 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 the, the, the question of, 
you know, how do how do non-Japanese look at their market, look at look at this market, and and try and apply their models and, and make sense of it. One, I mean, you're 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 pushing a, an external um, an external force on a market that doesn't need to pay attention to you, and that's one of the problems. I agree. So, at the end of the story is um, what I've, I guess I talked about it 10, 15 years ago. First, you know, the Japanese market is not a price discovery platform. It's just not. I mean, if you can't trade at negative enterprise value on an exchange for years and years and years and then assume that, well, this is, this is how we determine price. You know, I always, I always had a, a, a debate with my, my team. <laughs> like, well, what, you know, why is the stock going up? You know, it's, it's a one times EBITDA and nothing's going on. I said, why is it going up? Like, who's selling it? It's not, it's not, you know, the market's going up. It's who's crazy enough to sell it at this price? Who's crazy enough to sell it at a discount to cash? But what's, what's going through their head? Because they probably know something that we don't because they own the shares and we don't. So what's going on? So, you know, this whole concept of, of value trap is, you know, incredible hubris yes. on the part of the person who's saying, well, you know, I know more than the market. I promise you, you don't. But if you're willing, and this goes back to, you know, why we've been doing this for so long. If you're willing to take the time and effort to understand the very idiosyncratic reason for company X to be trading at what you deem to be, discount to what it's you know fair value should be whether that's some of the parts or discount or a dcf model or an lbo model or whatever you're using um, then you have to have a plan for implementing some catalyst with management because it's not going to happen by itself the fact that you bought some cheap and then you're waiting for the market to miraculously recognize the value and then you can sell it to them that's not a business plan so, you know, is your question, you know, we've been doing this for a very long time and you know, I would argue we've been pretty good at it, is we have a plan. Right. Finding something cheap is easy. I, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds of companies. You remember when we started, there were hundreds of companies trading at, you know, discounted cash. Right. Okay, right. Granted, things are not that bad anymore or maybe they should, maybe they should be there again. Um, but without a plan, assuming that the market is then going to come and recognize the value and then take you out at a higher price, that's a bad investment strategy. Yeah. We've I mean, seen it all before. We've seen it all before. And, you know, it's, I got my whiteboard behind me. I can draw some pictures and stuff today. But, yeah. you know, I've, I, I, I used to have this, this um, chart. We called it the thousand day rule. And it would be a chart of you know, some big fund in the U.S., smart guys buying in and buying up, 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 and then them trying to get out and going down, 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 down. And, and it's like every thousand, I call it the thousand day rule because that was kind of like the PM's longevity. Yeah. You know, yeah. The PM on that fund would be there for like three years and right. someone else would come in and then start selling and go, wow, I don't like this company. Um, so you know, I, identifying cheap is, is not the issue. It's having a plan for the market to then re-rate it completely. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw you into um, something that you said on Nick's call last night. That, you know, 72% of all the activist campaigns and whatnot were in small and mid caps. And the large cap campaigns of, you know, somewhat, died off and I was scratching my head because it's like well 85% of the listed companies in Japan are small and mid cap right so actually on a percentage basis you know I would expect more yeah no 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 my point was simply that I think a lot of people when they think of activism they think of Dan Loeb and Sony or they think about value act and Olympus yeah. whereas yeah. Uh, the point is that as you say I mean it, it, you know there are good companies in Japan who trade cheaply, who you know, need to change the market perception about them, uh, but they're not generally Panasonic or Hitachi or whoever, right? Yeah. 
And again, the point I was making there is if you're running an active fund where you got $40 billion under management, you can't screw around with like Panasonic home, right? Yeah. And so, and you can't. Yeah. 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 So and, so, and it le that leads you to a different kind of activism or engagement or whatnot, because you know you're not you're not trying to necessarily um, you know double or triple your money right. because exactly. I mean, with with the exception of some companies that are extremely poorly run and need total restructuring, um, you know, and I think that's a that's a completely different um, animal. I mean, I don't I don't know about that, and I don't know how some fund manager can presume to reorganize a company. Can I ask you a question about your chart about going up and going down? Because um, my wacky, completely by the seat of my pants theory is nobody ever buys Japan because they believe in Japan. I mean, foreign investors. They always buy it because they make a case that Japan is relatively cheap, right? It's cheap, relatively cheap. And then there's always some headline that Nikkei or the government puts up that gives the foreign investors an excuse to justify that view, right? Yeah. It's like the banking crisis is over or Abe is going to be crazy, right? right? Right, And so people come in and come out when they, because they get disillusioned or because the relative cheapness has disappeared because they're the ones who made it disappear, right? right. Um, and I guess I'm just wondering whether we've broken that cycle or are we just a different variety of that cycle? <laughs> Mm. Activists, again, part of the attraction for activists in Japan is because they've they've raked over the coals in the United States and Europe pretty good. Yeah. And so to me, it seems like just a continuation of the same cycle. What do you think? Yeah, you know, I have been beset by people looking at Japan and why should why should I invest in Japan? You know, just because it's cheap, it's always been cheap. Right. I'm like, well, uh, you know, and, and homage, homage to my school, but I'm never, I'll never stump for Japan, you know, as a, as a macro allocation, because th that's just not what I do. Um, you know, I think, I think as a, as a, as a stock market, it's very interesting, um, even before you know stewardship and governance codes came in, there were lots of freedoms for shareholders yes. um, to the extent yes. that they were willing to exercise them. More than in the U.S. Uh, and much better than in the U.S. I mean, you were pretty well protected. Um, you know, if you went to court, you'd probably have a problem because it's a very long process and people don't understand. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to sue you. It's like, yeah, well, it'll take you two years and cost you half a million dollars. Do you really want to do that? Uh, but you know when you when you look at that kind of you know periodicity to foreign investment in Japan coming and going coming and going um, with the uh, with the somewhat um, you know strange macro trends you you find both in Asia and the rest of the world look it's hard for people who have made a lot of money in U.S. and China over the past decade or two to then turn around and say, oh, well, I'm gonna invest in Japan. You know, Japan has become an asset class. It's like, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put some money in gold and some money in Japan. <laughs> How are those equivalencies? Right. Uh, well, it's a safe haven and I, I, I don't know. Um, I'm not gonna buy JGBs because they look overpriced. Um, but, you know, we, we, we try to dissect the market down to, well, what's what's mispriced i mean really mispriced not mispriced based on you know eyeballs or you know net interest margins or you know p potential growth of you know 5g but i mean you know we're a real asset buyer uh, you know when, when we first started it was like we were buying distressed assets in in good operating companies and no one could understand how is that possible because they tend to overlook, um, you know, Japan as a, you know, collection of really good companies with lots of assets, and look at it as an asset class, yeah. and that's probably the mistake. Um, you know, a lot of people, you know, I would say a lot of people have made in their overall allocations. I know, 
you know, my team talks to people in the U S and they're just like, well, we have no allocation to Japan. And again, it's like, well, you shouldn't have an allocation to Japan. You should have an allocation to things that look like they're offering exceptional value and a way to get that value. And whether that's through, you know, uh, you know, activism or arbitrage or M and A or PE, the fact that it takes place in Japan should be secondary to the investment decision. Right. But you let know. me hammer down on, on, I find this attitude of yours really interesting that, uh, so you find good value and then you, you said 15 minutes ago, and I, you said this to me before, you know, your, your goal is to somehow change the market's perception of this company. And you've mentioned a couple of things that you focus on in order to achieve that goal. I wonder if you would share them with us, but just let me, let me um, make a comment on what you just said. So you talked about people investing in Japan as an asset class and that's wrong. And I, I quite get it. But on the other hand, you know, we have to talk later on in the discussion or somebody will raise a question about the rise of passive vehicles and the role of the Bank of Japan you know, in pushing past it, because that's also another, it's in every market, it's a big problem, right? But in Japan, it may be a special problem. But go back to like, how do you, I hate this phrase, it's meaningless, unlock value. But, you know, you take a company that's a, a well-run company that's got good assets, that's trading at a huge discount to whatever, you know, how do you help that company? Okay. Yeah. The, 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 the first step in, in unlocking value, yeah, I hate it too, um, is you have to reconnect management with the fact that they're listed and what those responsibilities are. And oftentimes, you know, being listed is, is undertaken for other reasons. Yes. It's not, um, oh, you know, we need to be a listed company because we need to raise capital. It's something else right and we're not going to run we don't run our company as a listed company so having that you know that dialogue first so well why are you listed what's what's the purpose you know you're spending a million dollars a year and your net income is five <laughs> is there a better way to spend your money why do you want to do this um and then you can start to have a dialogue with people um in management to understand what's their motivation. Is there a motive to being listed? And once you, once you establish, well, there is or there isn't, um, then it gives you some sort of direction to, uh, you know, do I wanna work with this team? Do they really care about their shareholders and more importantly, their share price? Because that's all, you know, I mean, that's our job, it's just share price. Uh, and would they do things that would necessarily improve their visibility and their marketability to other um, stock market participants. You know, all this comes down to is, you know, the stock market is a beauty pageant, <laughs> just a beauty pageant um, for better or for worse. And if you are in the beauty pageant, but sitting, you know, behind the curtain, nobody's going to vote for you with their dollars. Right. Okay. So most of the companies we've seen, you know, I've, I've been to one company, um, I will disclose, Roco Butter. And I went there because it's a great brand name. You know, it's, it's, it's owned widely in Japan by, you know, families because they get discounts. And we had a nice chat with the, I can't even remember who it was, like a CFO. And he's like, well, yeah, thanks for coming, but we don't need any more shareholders. And I mean, the meeting was over in, in 20 minutes. So I'm like, okay, well, I guess you guys have figured it all out. Um, so, you know, the, the ability to, you know, it, it's not about, you know, doing share buybacks or increasing, you know, dividend payout ratios. You know, that was kind of interesting you know, five, five years ago when it had some lasting impact uh, you know, on share price. Now it's you know, very ephemeral. A couple, but, couple of days, a couple of weeks, and the impact is gone. Stock splits, I think, have a much um, greater uh, impact um, on... I don't like I don't like to say unlocking value, but to make it more accessible. Make yeah, I mean making it more accessible. You know, inviting um, more people to that beauty pageant to be judges. 
Right. And you know, this is something our friends at the at uh, JPEX, you know, are working on. And it's very important that they understand, you know, changing the the very undemocratic nature of the capital markets. Yeah, um, is very important. And, That's a great point. You know, if any of our friends <clears throat> are on the call, uh, you know, they've heard me say this. You know, every time we meet, you know, changing the the minimum trading unit to one. Or less, if you want to have like a Robin Hood you know, type of uh, you know, uh, setup in Japan, where you can trade you know, fractional shares, that will get more participants in the market. And then 70% of the trading activity will not be foreign bots. Right. It will be the Japanese trading their own market. And if you want to fix the stock market, that's the way to do it. Okay, let me push on you about this beauty pageant thing idea, because to me, it sounds, maybe I'm not understanding correctly, which is definitely possible, but um, it seems like a contradiction to me. It's like you're talking about companies are listed companies for the wrong reason, or they have never really thought about why they should be listed. And you're talking about a beauty pageant, which will increase their share price or unlock value. But what's the incentive for that to do that? Your, 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 your example well, of butter company is, is exactly right. So, I mean, there's a lot of talk now about aligning CEO compensation with the shareholders, or is it you know, a better stock price to avoid being attacked by an activist or a better stock price so that you have currency for mergers? Why do people care about the stock price to the extent that they do? Hey, I think you just answered your question. You know, it's, <laughs> it's do you care about you, you know, the, the, the share price at all? And if mm. you don't, maybe you shouldn't be listed. Mm. That, that's an opportunity. Right. You know, you know MBOs have been you know, pretty, um, uh, pretty aggressively you know, undertaken in the past couple of years. I mean, most people don't know it. You know, we did the first MBO in Japan under a, under a shell company back in was it 2005. It was 2005, Central Uni. Uh, and you know, we've, done a, we've, we've pushed for a couple more over the years, I think we've done like four or five, uh, because a lot of companies don't need to be listed. They don't need to worry about their shareholders. Yeah. They don't need to listen to activist shareholders. Right. And right. you know, I remember when, um, when just after we started, you had you know, Steel and Mac and a couple of others. And during that period, the conversations were very much about um, you know, we tried to explain what a white knight was, and I was like, you know, I don't know what you're talking about. And I said, well, you're, you know, you're trading at a discount, uh, you know, you're 160% net cash to market cap. Someone's going to come in and buy you out right. in the not friendly way. Right. So in order for you to protect your position in the company, you got to get your share price up. And, you know, that conversation you know, had a pretty good trajectory for a couple of years. Uh, you know, then you had Bulldog Sauce and a few other things and, you know, it all kind of collapsed um, because people believed that they could, you know, uh, you know roll out poison pills and, and protect themselves. Uh, but I think we've, you know, during that period, it was very much foreign driven. Yes. And my contention, I think it was in my, my, my first deck in 2003, was you know, the Japanese market is fundamentally broken as a stock market. You know, because there's no market for control. So yeah. how, do you, how do you change the share price? What's the motivation? Right. Exactly your point. But my next slide was, it won't be fixed until the Japanese choose to fix it. Exactly. And <laughs> no, no. Nobody from you know Fifty Seventh and Madison is going to change right. change the way the Japanese the Japanese stock market works, and it's only going to change the Japanese stock market is only going to change once all the what's called the, the cultural trends in Japanese business and society afford that kind of change, and it's not going to happen you know because of some edict. Right. There's no way. Yeah. You know, and, and you know I would I I would and continue to argue that the stewardship and governance codes, you know, they weren't concocted by, by the FSA. You know, they came about before they were concocted. I don't, the, the, trends, the trends that, the ideas that went into 
having uh, you know a a stewardship and governance code became part of the the dialogue years and years before they were written on paper yeah i got it i got it yes you know yes. daiko henjo was probably yes. maybe the biggest the biggest um, catalyst for oh my god we need to fix the pension fund industry here right. from the government level because otherwise we're going to be stuck with this liability for everybody yeah if i can interrupt anybody on the call who wants to know what daiko henjo is email me later Sorry. but it's essentially a shake-up of the pension fund industry um yeah, uh, so I want to ask you, um, you know, the, 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 the traditional conversation about, you know, the attractiveness of Japan as a market, people always talk about two or three impediments, which I want to talk about in a minute. But, you know, Mr. Maruki of, of Strat Capital, Strategic Capital, you know, I, 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 I I'm always thinking about his point of view that the stewardship code and the corporate governance code mean nothing. That top down is not going to fix anything. That it's up to investors and people like him to go from company to company to company to talk about what is return on invested capital or what is whatever you know margin you want to talk about. And I you know you can agree or disagree with his strategy, but I think there is something in what he's saying about this top down until you get the likes of the biggest Japanese institutional investors, you know, yeah. get religion, then he's probably right that these top down approaches are not going to help much. So the typical response is when I ask the question to people, like, what's the biggest impediment to better run companies in Japan or to better corporate governance in Japan, they always say, cross your holdings, right? Or, and then they might say this issue about parent company subsidiaries being listed on the exchange, minority shareholders don't have any rights, blah, blah, blah. To me, it's more about labor mobility, right? It's that you can't hire the right person for the job because you can't fire the You wrong can't person. fire the wrong person for the job. <laughs> right? And there is no liquid. And that's why I think, in fact, the American right. style of activism is doomed to fail because it presumes a deep, rich market for executives and outside board members, which in Japan doesn't exist at this moment. Yeah, I, th I think you know you're 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 going down the right path there. Um, I'll 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 mention you know cross shareholding. When we started, every bank owned four point nine percent of every company, so you know twenty five percent of free flow was gone. We're not in that situation anymore, and I think you know we're probably down to mid-teens level of cross shareholding um, in, in total shares outstanding. So I don't think cross shareholding is nearly as uh, big a problem as it used to be. So I don't, I don't, I don't buy that the, argument. It depends on the company, though, doesn't it? Yeah, exactly. It's always you know company specific. You know, parent subs. Um, you know, that's a a system that has seen its day parent sub listings um you know it was kind of interesting you know 20 30 years ago um less useful now uh so i'm 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 sure a lot of that will get um sorted out in the years to come it's it's a it's a hard thing to be an investor in that kind of strategy because you have no control over the takeout price so yeah, sure. You know, the average lately has been a thirty percent premium. But what if a company is trading at point six times book, and nice operations and whatnot, and they try and take you out at a thirty percent premium? Like, wait a second. You know, this should be a two hundred percent premium. So your recourse is very limited there. Um, so it's it's not something we we, we tend to. We, you have no control. So I don't I don't like that. But you know the. You know, I think Maruki-san is right. You, you, know, you have to go bottom up. You know, culturally, trying to deploy um, Western style of engagement, whatever, however level you want to take that, um, assumes that the markets are the same. Right. And you have to just suck up. You know, be be a little bit humble and say, you know, Japan is Japan because it's different. Okay, understand, the, if, in, if you don't understand the way Japanese business works and Japanese societies work, you're not gonna get it done. You're just not gonna get it done. Um, you know, you know, go back to my opening comments, when I was an analyst, that's what always really 
distressed me about American investors. It's like they got their spreadsheets, they got their model, they put the numbers in, the answer comes out, and that's the answer. Well, just because it might work in New York or Chicago or LA or whatever, doesn't mean it's going to work in Japan. And, you know, then there you get accused of saying, well, you're a Japan specialist, so you have a vested interest in saying that only I can, inter- you know, can interpret Japan for you, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, it, and, uh, and, and, then the, and then it's finish your tea, cool. go back to Narita, and come back next year. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's, that's, that's pretty much what happens. Uh, you know, the financial models can look great, but your assumption in that is the management of your, whatever target company you're talking about is not smart enough to do the same model that you and every other MBA in the United States and Europe is doing, that's wrong. I mean, you know, walking in and saying, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a sell side analyst and you guys should change your business model. Cause yeah. I started looking at your company, you know, two months ago. Right. And I know you've been there 20 years, but I know better. Right. That that's, you know, there's, there's a reason companies trade at levels that they trade at all day, every day. There's two sides. Somebody's selling just as much as somebody's buying. So you, know, you really have to get into management's head to understand you know, what, is their, what is their relationship with being a listed company. And I think if anything, that's where the stewardship and governance codes have made good progress. Yeah, I, I want to come back to this um, issue about passive, the rise of passive and particularly BOJ investment in passive as it applies to corporate governance and stewardship and engagement with companies and so on and so forth. We do have about six, oh, now we have eight questions from the floor. Um, so I want to ask. Oh, I gotta go. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, there's, one, there's one historic question from Mark. I don't know who, who Mark is, but it says, uh, what did Steel Partners and, War- and Warren do right and what did they do wrong in Japan? And I'm sure you have a view about that. Um, I mean, what did they do, what did they do right? Um, you know, they, they, they made some very uh, good stock selections. Yes. Uh, you know, I think, I think you know, Warren um, you know, has a good nose for what is mispriced. Um, I, I think he and, and Tom you know, went, went down a path that unknowingly you know, turned the business community against them. Right. And they probably, it, it, it didn't matter, you know, advising them otherwise. And I, I look, I, I know, I know Warren, I know Tom, I know the team very well. It's like, you know, that was their strategy and they wanted to try it, you know, in Japan. And, you know, it might've worked at the time. Uh, I think they were, you know, unlucky, maybe ahead of their time by two decades. Um, but, you know, they gave it a pretty good shot. Um, you know, I don't want to get into too, too many details, but, you know, Japanese, management had unified against him yeah and it was it was very clear because we knew intimately some of his portfolio companies but you know can i can i interject for a minute to me that attitude you still see here and there is very much alive for example the way in which the railroad companies united against fir tree who had very reasonable proposals about just let's put qualified people on the board and all the railroad companies kind of locked arms and said, we're circling the wagons here. So I see that yeah. attitude is still very much yeah, alive. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, I, I think uh, you're, you, I can't remember whose comment it was that, you know, it, it does matter who and how proposals are made. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've always taken the tack that we don't want to make proposals. We want to dialogue with management so that management makes the proposal. And, and that, that does take longer, but it, um, it has higher probability of success. Okay, given that you don't make proposals, so put that aside for a minute, uh, there was an activist who said to me, I thought it was a really interesting comment. He said, <clears throat> you know, the, the, the 
the comments that you hear in Japan these days is that we've learned that activists are not all bad and that the media is becoming more sympathetic and generally speaking the general public sort of understands that they're not all bad guys however this person said to me you know he thought that when you make a shareholder proposal what's most important to japanese institutional investors is not the proposal it's who's making the proposal and who is supporting the proposal absolutely you know? That's yeah, but that made Absolutely. me rather well, sad. You, 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 raised, you raised a lot of interesting points there. Um, first of all, we, we don't make shareholder proposals at an AGM, but we have dialogue with management constantly in which we're discussing things that would otherwise be con constitute a proposal. So mm -hmm. what about this idea? What about that idea? And trying to understand you know, what their sensitivities are. Right. And, you know, why things that are perfectly reasonable and we're sure they're smart enough to know, why aren't they, why aren't they going down that path? And, and you try and help both parties, ourselves, and then understand why this, whatever it may be, is not moving forward. And hopefully, uh, you know, you've, you've had enough interaction with, with management on different levels that it becomes their proposal. Mm, yes. That they yes. that they adopt it as if it was, wow. Yeah. This is, we we've, I, I hate to use the word educated, but we've seen the light that maybe this is an okay way to do things, and it works for us. Yeah. You know what? What I think. Um, what I think Japanese management um, has come to understand is there are proposals that are universally. Um, helpful for the organization, for for not just shareholders, but you know, for 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 the business, um, you know, for their clients and for employees, and those things kind of get adopted. But then there's a very scornful um, look at uh, proposals which seem to only help the shareholder. Yes. Yes. And and and. We don't like that, right? We don't yeah, like well, the perception, the perception by the general public and the media that you know, all activists or all you know, shareholders who speak up um, are not bad uh, has changed dramatically you know, in, in the past 20, 20 some odd years. Uh, you know, there's no Hagetaka fund, you know, vulture fund um, conversations going on thank you media um, you know there was there was not a huge backlash I mean, to, to talk about something you know current uh, not a huge backlash on the action of Colawide towards Otoya which is a very hostile deal right and but but I, I bring that up because that's a domestic operator yeah, right. Right. going after a domestic operator <laughs> right and right. this the fact that we're at this point in the let's call it the evolution for market uh, market for control and it's a very hostile deal and nobody's like oh the management of colo should be shot you know we should boycott them or anything right right it's been pretty well accepted i mean i don't know about you know, yeah this is so interesting the economic of the deal but this is so interesting to me that whereas you know decades ago it was people like steel partners and carl icon and a few others who were kind of shaking the trees a little bit and you know not getting very far but these days, it's the domestic, it's the domestic yeah. activists who are promoting change. So we have a bunch of really good questions. Um, I want to ask, uh, the first one that caught my eye was from our friend Tim Foley in New York, who says, for companies that shouldn't be listed, quotes, you know, your phrase, shouldn't be listed, what is their hesitation to go private? What's the pushback that you, you get? It's a big decision for companies to delist. Right. You know, I mean, it's it's not. Uh, you know, you're you're making a decision on your watch to delist a company that may have been you know listed for 20, 30, 50 years. Um, so management uh, uh, you know, is more, I would say, more more susceptible to doing a some sort of delisting activity uh, if it's a family-run company where the founder 
uh, is is now you know in his seventies or older, uh, you know, and succession may be an issue, but but it has you know, to do other, otherwise. And you know, and, and Tim, it's it's a great question because I've I've been to these meetings. Like, why are you guys listed? Well, you know, my father, my grandfather listed the company, so you know that was his wish. So, okay, but he's dead. Stock doesn't trade. <laughs> I mean, nobody trades your stock. Nobody's interested in your stock. Why do you stay listed? And, you know, I've had more than my share of those conversations. And, you know, many of the answers are somewhat unsatisfactory. Okay, here's another good question um, from Patrick. Uh, he says, why does Symphony not seek board seats, even though you take controlling stakes in some companies? What do I need a board seat for? I mean, a board seat doesn't afford you anything. You know, one of the biggest problems we, I have with, with this concept of, oh, Japan has made so much progress on you know, independent board members. It's like, I don't know, tell that to the shareholders at Toshiba. Exactly. You, know, exactly. you, you need independent boards, not independent I, board members. Thank you. And Patrick, so, and, I, would, I would say that, you know, it's not the existence of independent board directors, it's the CEO who chooses to use those people or not, yeah. what kind of people he's choosing to be on the board. You know, Toshiba, to, to get back to your, your point, Toshiba on paper has the best corporate governance in Japan, pretty much. Got yeah. All the committees and it's got, you know, 12, 12 independent, 10 independent board directors. By the way, I just happen to notice that very few of those independent directors own any stock in Toshiba, which is, yeah. which know, is also, you know, right. a, a very strange thing. Right. So yeah. So there's there's very little incentive there. Um, you know, there's there's not enough compensation in stock. Forget about buying. There's no optionality in, right. your, in your board seat. Only liability. Right. right. Um, you know, good business for you know B and O insurance here, uh, D and O insurance. Um, and um, you know, back to the, the you know Patrick's question. You know, we we don't it. it you know, Symphony doesn't gain anything by being on a board. You only lose something. Right. Because, you, you, you know, you're stuck on a board. You can't trade stock if you need to. You can't be involved um, in the planning of, of, a, of a delisting. Right. So, you know, right. You're, you're all, you're all of a sudden, you're inside. That's a great um, answer. That's a great you answer. You know, we've, we've, we wouldn't have the position or any position if we didn't have a direct line of contact to the CEO. Yeah, and the other thing... And I, in a Japanese company, that's all you need. Right, right, exactly. And the other thing I would say to Patrick is that I've interviewed more than 50 independent directors in Japan, and uh, they fall into two categories. It's pretty binary. It's people who work like the Dickens to try to understand the company, but particularly if they're nominated from outside, they will never get traction with the internal people. The yeah. second... The second category is people who've been invited by the company and they've generally chosen because they're not like the first type, that they're just going to sit there and go, yeah. this is harsh. But they can well, I think, you know, what the company does. Yeah. I mean, you know, you and I both know at, at least one um, foreign female in Japan who is a director at a number of big companies. He's also a professor, um, Hito Tsubashi, I think, um, who does a pretty good job as a director. But there's, I, I mean, to, to my knowledge, like, she's not moving policy. Well, I don't know. I mean, that's, I think that she's a friend, so I have to stick up for her because I know she yeah. does work very hard. And who knows what goes on behind closed doors in the board. But, um, exactly. Right, but let me move on to, I don't know if you, Michael Van Sant, who is a fellow Columbia alum, who um, is a friend, he is in uh, MedTech, and he's saying, while scale and scope are very different, I look at Teramo as a kind of mini J&J, &J. and Teramo trades at a PE of 17, J&J &J is a PE of 27, how do I like square this circle? Is it fair to compare these two? I, I can't even begin to answer that question. I mean, rel relative PEs between countries, you know, is more a function of, you know, risk premia um, among the market participants as a whole. Perception right. of risk premia, uh, you know, 
than than anything else. I don't know. I got a buy question. Buy terrible short J and J. I don't know. Right. There's a question here. I wouldn't that do that. But. There's a question here um, that I'm going to give to you, which you can refuse to answer if you like. I can't answer it because I'm a consultant to Elliot. Somebody here is asking about what do you think of the clash between SoftBank and Elliot? I'm not sure I would call it a clash. I shouldn't comment, but I'm not sure I would call it a clash. What do you think? Mm. I think, you know, there are a couple of companies in Japan that are sufficiently international with their management teams that have a good perception of, you know, what should be, what should be done um, in the face of both um, uh, you know, opposition from, from meaningful shareholders or dialogue from meaningful shareholders and what should be done, you know, somewhat in general. I, I don't think, you know, God bless the guys at Elliott, I don't think they were the main catalyst in causing Masa to do a big share buyback. Yep. I think his shares trading at 2,600 was a big catalyst to doing it. Okay. So mm, this is kind of cheap and I'm, I've been beaten up, you know, for WeWorks. So what are my responses that, that could re-energize my attractiveness in the beauty pageant. Mm, mm, mm. And, you know, this was one of them. Um, you know, <laughs> you know if, if Elliot really wanted to go after something, I, I think you'd probably want to go after the structure of the Vision Fund preferred shares um, and SoftBank's investment in them. Yeah. You know, but that's, that's kind of a different, you know, that's a different game. Do you want to, do you want to call out Masa for, you know, making bad investments in Yahoo and Alibaba. Uh, you, know, you know, often what happens is when somebody becomes, you know, extraordinarily wealthy on the basis of one or two, you know, mega win investments, somehow they're right on everything. Right, right. And, well, and they can't be told they're wrong. And a lot of people, you know, buy into that. There's certainly a couple of good examples I could think of in America. But um, yeah. I think we have time for just one last question. So I apologize to everybody whose question I didn't get to. And again, if you want to email me and I'll talk to David or I can answer or whatever. But Tim L, whoever Tim L is, says, having management own the change themselves and avoiding public pro proposals is the deal outcome in Japan, as you said. However, if management knows you will never make a formal pr public proposal, shareholder proposal, how often does the carrot only approach and with management refusing, ignoring, or just outweighting you? And what is your default action in that scenario? Is it just to walk away? Um, yeah, man management, I mean, I, I won't talk about you know, symphony strategies so much, but I do know that management uh, at many companies here believe they can um, wait out uh, you know, any, any particularly aggressive you know, activist. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think they're right. <laughs> you know, it's like, well, you know, after two or three years, okay, well, you know, I'm kind of done. I need to move on. Or they no longer have their job right. as a PM. Right. Um, you know, you know we, we take a very, very long-term approach to our investment strategy. I mean, we're, we're just not trading stock. So, you know, we, we, we invest in, comp in good companies that we like their business model to begin with. We want to stick with them and we want to help them, you know, improve their attractiveness to other shareholders. That's how we make money, get the share price up. But we wouldn't get involved, you know, in a situation where, A, it's not a great business and management isn't sound to begin with. Look, we don't agree with management and they don't agree with us on a, on a lot of things, but we all agree on the, on the you know, particularly great business that they may be running and you know, how, how they're able to re have the rest of the world recognize that is usually the point of contention, not where do you make your widgets and who buys them. Yeah, yeah. Um, I've had I'll give you one more. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Yeah, I think no, no. I'll give you one more question and then I got to run. No, I think we only have one minute, so it's time for me to wrap up. Um, I just want to thank you for getting up so early and doing this. And I want to thank everybody for um, staying on the call and fielding so many good questions. I'm sorry we didn't get to them all. Somebody named Mark asked a question about ESG, David, which is a shame because the, both the two of us love to rag on ESG. Um, so hopefully we have another time to uh, follow up. But thanks to everybody for, for joining. Uh, I, um, I want to mention that um, we have uh, another upcoming webinar coming up, which is probably very inconvenient for Japan time, but it's an overview of the, of the most recent AGM uh, season uh, with a gentleman from ISS and a gentleman from the Tokyo Stock Exchange. So I hope um, all of you will sign up for that one and ask uh, a, a, a similar amount of really good pressing um, substantive questions. So thank you for that. Um, and I think it just remind, it remains for me to thank all of our amazing sponsors who, uh, without whom we couldn't do the amazing number of things that we do. I invite you to visit our website. Um, we have all kinds of programs, not just research and events like this, but we sponsor PhD students. We do a lot of stuff. And it's all because of these wonderful sponsors who, as I said, have not only given us financial support, but are so useful to us in terms of helping us um, you know, decide on directions to take. So thanks to all of them. Thanks to all of you on the call. And thanks to all of our great team at CGIP who, um, who got me through this. So have a good night in New York and have a good day in Tokyo. And hopefully we'll see you at one of the other events soon. Thank you.